Welcome to Spotlight. Russia says there will be consequences if Britain violates its territorial waters again. The Russian ambassador to the UK has said that his country would make it more difficult for British military vessels to enter its waters next time because, uh, quote, this is not the first time a British warship has done this. Andre Kellen was referring to a June intrusion by the British Navy destroyer HMS Defender as it sailed into Russia's territorial waters near Crimea in the Black Sea. Well, the Russian Defense Ministry said at the time that it had fired warning shots at the vessel off the coast of the Crimean Peninsula. Moscow also slammed Britain for violating international law and denounced the move as a dangerous and provocative one. Well, the UK, however, claimed the ship was in a commonly used transit route in accordance with international law. Now, to get further insight uh, on uh, the issue, we're joined uh, by political analyst John Bosnich, who's with us from Belgrade. And also joining us on tonight's uh, Spotlight, we have writer and political analyst John White, who's with us from Edinburgh. Well, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Let's start off with Mr. Bosnich in Belgrade. Russia has issued a warning to the UK. You heard the comments saying that it will be uh, difficult now for British warships to pass through the disputed uh, Black Sea if they choose to do so in the future. What do you make of the comments? Well, I think this is a, a standard uh, statement by a sovereign country that its territorial waters are inviolate and that uh, that England does not have the right legally or practically to pass through Russian territorial waters without Russian permission. Um, I think that Russia is smart to give the warning in advance so that if there are any complications, if anything does develop in this case, that uh, they can simply say that you were warned and we have taken actions in uh, keeping with our sovereign rights. Uh, John White, the Russian ambassador to the UK, Andre Kellen, said that it would be much harder for a UK military vessel to enter Russia's territorial waters without notice next time. Now, if we go back to when the incident happened, uh, Russia's deputy foreign minister, Sergei Ryabkov, was quoted as saying, uh, what can we do? We can appeal to common sense, demand respect for international law. If this does not help, um, we can uh, bomb not only in the direction, but also on target if our colleagues do not understand. Those were some heavy words back then. Uh, what do you yeah. think about this new warning coupled uh, with, uh, with the comments uh, that were made by the Russians back in June? Well, it's very simple. Moscow has had enough of these repeated provocations on the part of a fading uh, imperial hegemon in the UK. And it is very clear that in the context of Brexit, uh, London is determined to try and prove its worth to Washington with these increasing, increasingly bellicose acts towards Russia. And it's clear that the cynical attempt to cultivate and promote enemies abroad is done with the objective of, it, of distracting from escalating and deepening injustices at home. Britain is trying to remain relevant in this post, uh, the Brexit landscape, and it's using Russia as a flogging horse in, in an attempt to do so. But uh, the Russians have had enough, rightly so, and they're drawing a red line. And it's high time this was done. The UK has been able to pose as a major power in the world stage under the umbrella of US hegemony. And the Russians understand this. And in Moscow, there is cold contempt for the UK in this regard. So this is a very much needed red line on the part of the Russians. They've been very restrained hitherto when it comes to these repeated provocations by the UK. And they've simply had enough. And I think that London would be well served to heed this warning because when you poke the bear, the bear will roar at a certain point. John Bozic, uh, as our guest in Edinburgh mentioned, Russians apparently have had enough. There was talk of this not being the first time when tensions were high between Kiev and Moscow. Uh, if uh, you recall, the UK sent a Royal Navy ship uh, to the Black Sea port of Odessa in a show of support for Ukraine back in 2018. Uh, so. Uh, uh, it's uh, worth saying that this is not without precedent, was it? No, there's definitely uh, there's definitely a building level of tension here, and I think that England is going to start getting back a little bit of what it's been giving out around the world for hundreds of years. Um, other countries, which were the target of English colonial activity, 
occupation, unjustified wars of aggression, are now asserting their territorial uh, limits. And uh, this is particularly bothersome for England because England has been able to basically operate a pirate navy around the world running the, as they did in the old days. In the daytime, they have the Union Jack, and at the nighttime, or when there's nobody watching, they run up the Jolly Roger. The same ship, the same crew, just their uniforms not so visible. Now, uh, we have to put this in context here. England is simultaneously threatening both Russia and China with its so-called freedom of the seas approach. Now, freedom of the seas is a concept which is accepted internationally, which is the right to travel from two legitimate destinations across open seas. There is no need for the English fleet to be in the Black Sea, except if it's projecting the outdated power of the English empire. England has no territory in the area. England is, of course, engaged in provocations in Ukraine, where it has special forces trying to disrupt the region and push the ethnic Russians out of Donbass. But as far as it goes for the sea lanes, the English Navy has no business being there, except perhaps an, as an observer of confirmed international trade. When we, come, when we couple this with the increasing levels of provocation that England is posing to China, especially in the Taiwan Straits and in the South China Sea, we are looking at a situation in which the so-called invincible English fleet could be facing two military confrontations at the same time. And that is a recipe for disaster. What we're looking at here effectively for the English fleet is what happened to the French army at Bien Dien Phu outnumbered, surrounded, and destroyed. If that happens, that will be the single biggest change in international relations in more than 300 years. John White, uh, would you like to add anything to that? No, that's a very eloquent analysis, and I agree wholeheartedly with every word and every particular. We have to fast, uh, th bring things to the present. This was in June. We're now looking at the debacle in Afghanistan, where the US under Joe Biden didn't even consult with the UK with regards to its withdrawal, its precipitous withdrawal. And that shows you what Biden thinks of this special relationship. The special relationship, so-called, only ever existed in the hearts and minds of UK political and in the UK political establishment. For the US and Washington, UK was always seen as a proxy, not an ally. And this is being played out in Afghanistan as we speak. I think the UK is in a crisis. I think it's headed for perdition. I think it's headed for ruination. I think it's headed for its eventual breakup. And one of the most wonderful and poetic historical ironies is that Brexit, rather than bolstering UK power under the auspices of global Britain, as supporters of Brexit have maintained that Brexit has ushered in, is only ushered in the eventual breakup of the UK. And when that day comes, when Ireland becomes united, when Scotland becomes independent, a cry of freedom will ring out around the world, such as never been heard before. Uh, Mr. John White, I'm going to stay with you. Would, uh, in your opinion, would inciting conflict uh, in the Black Sea be something that the U.S. and uh, Britain are comp contemplating? Given uh, the heightened tensions between Moscow on one side, we've got the U.S., the U.K., also the E.U., add them to the mix on the other. What kind of repercussions do you think would there be from any further standoffs in the Black Sea region? It's over for the West. This happened in June. Uh, the Afghanistan, the debacle, the scramble out of Central Asia changes everything and changes it utterly. This is a historic, historic tipping point. It's a, a major signpost on the way to Western US-led hegemonic imperial decline. The West is in retreat. The West is no longer the dominant power, the dominant bloc. The, 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 the West unipolar moment after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 is over. Everyone's looking to the East. The East has the, the solutions to the challenges of the 21st century. The West is over. And as I said earlier, it is a wonderful thing to see because of the, the, the carnage, the carnage, the chaos, the instability, the mayhem wrought 
by US-led Western hegemony since the fall of the Soviet bloc. And Mr. Abazic, I see you nodding there. Would you like to uh, add anything to uh, comments made by Mr. White? Well, I have to say it's a pleasure to be commenting with a with a fellow a fellow analyst who shares every one of my views on the same subject. And uh, uh, we come from very different backgrounds, and uh, we're looking at this from. I'm here in in Serbia, in southeastern Europe, and I grew up in Canada, and I spent 20 years in Japan as a political analyst and advisor. And I can tell you that from all of the places that I've worked in. The signs are more than clear. The English, and I, I, I refer to it as England. I don't refer to it as the UK or Britain. It's ruled from London, and it's an English ruling class. The English ruling class is now facing its potential last hurrah. And uh, because they are worried, they are being aggressive. That's the first sign that a party is worried. You don't need to flex your muscles unless you're worried that the other party has bigger muscles than you do. And what we're seeing is the English empire is falling back on its tried and true tactics of jingoism. By jingo, we have the means and so on. And it will not work. The new weapons that have been displayed publicly by President Putin of Russia and which have been quickly adopted and supported by China are so far advanced that the English Navy is like a dugout canoe facing a laser weapon from out, outer space. This would be such an unequal conflict that I could see several principal ships being sunk with all hands lost in a matter of days. England needs some new advisors and they need some new thinking. This is a multilateral world today. It is no longer somebody calling the shots in London or Washington. Mr. Bosnich, uh, I'm going to stay with you uh, for this one. Um, how does all of this, you know, when uh, there are provocations uh, in, in areas such as uh, uh, the Black Sea, when you add Russia to the mix, there is always going to be ripple effects near and far. How does all of this, the Black Sea incident, the Western troop buildup in Ukraine, in addition to NATO's eastward expansion, how does this play into the rivalry between Russia and NATO? Russia has already made it clear that NATO membership for Ukraine would be a red line for Moscow at this point. NATO membership for Ukraine would be insane. NATO membership, first of all, under the rules of NATO, Ukraine cannot join NATO and NATO cannot accept Ukraine because one of the fundamental requirements of the acceptance of a state as a NATO member is that that state has control over its full and entire territory and its full and entire external border. As we know, the regime in Kiev, which was placed in power by the neocons in Washington, who staged an illegal coup, that regime in Kiev does not rule the country of Ukraine. It rules just as far as its official army and its neo-Nazi war groups can hold by the barrel of a gun. And that does not include Donbass, that does not include the former Ukrainian territory of Crimea. There is nothing on this earth short of nuclear war that could affect the status of Crimea. And even in the case of nuclear war, Crimea would re remain a part of Russia. So that story is already a finished, printed, closed book. If England attempts at this time to pressure China, it will be bringing even more disaster upon itself because it will be facing, as I mentioned earlier, a two-front war, which it is 100% certain to lose. And in the meantime, while England continues to do its saber rattling from its leaky ships offshore, there could very well be a visit by Russian warships up the Thames River 
or around the territorial waters of England. And in that case, it would be checkmate, and England wouldn't even have enough time to knock over its own king. John White, let's look at the issue of, uh, of Crimea and the whole sovereignty issue mm -hmm. from a different vantage point. Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula following a referendum back in 2014, so it considers areas around its coast to be Russian waters. Western countries, they deem Crimea to still be part of Ukraine. They reject Russia's uh, claim to the seas around it. Sergei Ryabkov said Washington and London are sowing strife by refusing to accept that Crimea is part of Russia. Now, there's clear hypocrisy again here by the likes of the United States. For example, they can accept illegal annexations and occupation by their allies, the Israelis, but when it's not in their own interests, they'll oppose it. Uh, first of all, I must respectfully disagree with your terminology. Russia did not annex Crimea. Uh, Crimea was liberated by Russia via a legal democratic referendum uh, in the wake of an unconstitutional coup that deposed the last all-Ukraine constitutional government under Viktor Yanukovych in 2014. Uh, the vast majority of people living in Crimea are Russian speakers or Russian ethnics, uh, ethnic Russians, sorry. And so Russia, as I say, liberated and saved Crimea from a fascistic take over from Kiev and, and by the way, uh, avoided huge bloodshed when this uh, coup government in Kiev attempted to uh, extend its writ to parts of Crimea that did not accept this coup that took place in Kiev. So this was a, this was a, a democratic referendum, more, democrat, more democratic, by the way, than the referendum that seceded Kosovo from Serbia uh, in 2009. So we have to get the term terminology correct, but the UK and the West in general has never accepted this this demarche when it comes to Crimea. Crimea is historically Russian, part of Mother Russia, and it's gone back to Mother Russia. And the vast majority of Crimeans are happy. There are no there are no patrolling gunmen in the streets. There are no Crimeans in jail because they refuse to accept Russia's writ. The vast majority, the vast majority, are very happy to be in the lap of Mother Russia in the wake of this unconstitutional coup that took place in Kiev at the start of 2014. But the West refuses to accept this for its own geopolitical and geostrategic reasons. That's the only reason. It's nothing to do with legality. It's everything to do with geopolitics and the geostrategic objectives when it comes to trying to impose a cordon sanitaire around Russia. And Mr. Barzic, your final thoughts on uh, the same issue as well while we wrap up the, uh, the program tonight. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the uh, the uh, so-called referendum in Kosovo was mentioned because I'm here right in the region. Um, the the so-called referendum in Kosovo was held after all of the minority groups, the local minority groups, the Serbs are, were a minority in the province, were driven out at pain of death, and then they held a referendum. The referendum that was held in uh, in uh, Crimea was held without the departure of any of the residents of Crimea. So it was a representative referendum. And it was such an overwhelming referendum that it was hard to find anybody who voted against rejoining Russia. And this is the key word here, rejoining Russia. Because one of the things that very few people mention is that Crimea was an integral part of Russia for many, many, many years, in fact, hundreds of years. And Crimea only became a part of Ukraine out of a kind of act of undemocratic behavior by a previous Soviet dictator who transferred it to Ukraine as a present without a referendum, without any due process. And at the time, in the 1950s, when that was done, the State Department of the United States and the Foreign Ministry of England declared it to be an unlawful and illegal act. So what that means is, both the United States and England know that the presence of Crimea in Ukraine was an unlawful and illegal status, which Russia corrected following England and America's own advice. History is a stubborn thing, and Americans don't study it at all. All right, gentlemen, we're going to leave it there. We're uh, fresh out of time for tonight's show. Allow me to thank my guest, political analyst John Bosnich. Joining us from Belgrade, also thanks to writer and political analyst John White, 
uh, joining us from Edinburgh. And also special thanks to you, our viewers, for staying with us on tonight's Spotlight. It's good night for now, and see you next time.